Hello, everyone. Uh, you could all hear me okay? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so the title of my talk is Portable BPF with CORE. Uh, I am on the open source engineering team at Aqua. Uh, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. These are my pronouns. You might see me on the eBPF Slack with uh, this little crab guy. So here's a, an outline of my talk, uh, followed by the slide we're going to be talking about uh, my experience as the uh, one of the maintainers of Tracy. Uh, we'll talk about what Tracy is, uh, our goal for distributing it, and how CRE helps us achieve that goal. Uh, and we're going to look towards the future of next steps in eBPF development, uh, especially as it relates to portability and distribution and how CRE fits into that. So uh, the primary project that I work on is Tracy. Uh, it's a eBPF project uh, that is, uh, it handles runtime detection uh, and forensics using eBPF. And the way that works is it uses hundreds of different events uh, things like system calls, trace points, uh, network TC hooks, LSM hooks, all things that you've learned uh, about earlier today. Uh, and if you're looking for a simple tool to use to gain a ton of visibility into your system, uh, Tracy is the kind of uh, drop-in tool that, that can let you do that. Um, and it also lets you apply policy on, on top of that. Um, and in this example, we could see uh, an exec VE system call that's being traced. So we're, we're specifying exec VE to be traced, uh, and we're, we have all this information about it. So we have the actual command line that caused this exec VE to trigger. Um, we have the timestamp, we have uh, process ID, parent process ID, all of this additional context. So it's a lot of uh, reading of memory in the kernel. That's essentially the primary thing that Tracy does. So the problem that we've observed while developing Tracy is that from kernel version to kernel version, there, is, there becomes differences in uh, data structures as we're, as we're reading them. So in this example here, we could see that there uh, is a different field that we're reading uh, in the task struct uh, for kernels before 419, and after that, we're reading something different. So our initial approach to handling these differences is to uh, have at runtime this check to see uh, what kernel version uh, we're dealing with and read from it accordingly. Uh, this, of course, has flaws, uh, one being that sometimes fields are renamed or completely removed. So we could run into errors where fields don't exist, so the code won't compile properly uh, against the headers that we're compiling with. Uh, also, it's just a, a real pain in the butt to deal with uh, when we want to support all these different distributions uh, and all the versions of those distributions. Uh, and if you're not paying attention to every mailing list and uh, you know, looking at every diff and every patch, it's hard to keep track of all the, all the differences in versions. Uh, not to mention if we have somebody that's running a custom kernel, you know, I'm not going to have a check saying like, if we're running on Grant's custom Gen2 kernel, then read from this field. Uh, so this is one approach that we've taken, uh, and clearly it has, it, has its flaws. Uh, in addition to that, what we were doing is doing the same thing that BCC does, which is build on the uh, kernel that we're deploying our project to. So as we deploy, or, or as a user picks up the, our uh, picks up Tracy, uh, and they run it for the first time, it would look for their kernel headers, build against those, um, uh, and then and then run from there and cache it somewhere. Uh, but this is of course an issue because you know we would get bug reports about um, Tracy not being able to be built because uh, let's say the kernel headers are missing, or you know perhaps we just aren't keeping track of all the different kernel header versions for every major distro. Like we would get, you know, we don't want to have to support scientific Linux 6 or, or something like that, like something very specific. So what do we want? We want to be able to write BPF code uh, without worrying about kernel version differences. 
we want to be able to distribute the BPF object where we can just host a single BPF object, have people download it, uh, and have Tracy uh, run it without any issue. Uh, we don't want to have to rely on a special kernel feature to do that. Uh, and for the most part, we don't need our users to know about that. So when do we want it? Uh, well, we have it now. So uh, this is what CORE, compile once, run everywhere, uh, enables us to do. So CORE is um, a concept that's enabled by libbpf. Uh, and these are essentially exactly what uh, it gives us. So, uh, right, so compile once run everywhere, or CORE, is a concept enabled by libbpf. Uh, there are helper functions within libbpf that will take into account kernel debug information to try and relocate kernel fields um, as they have changed from kernel version to version. Uh, and just to clarify that libbpf is a, a user space library uh, that is in the kernel uh, repository um, uh, and it's used for interacting with the BPF subsystem. So uh, loading BPF programs and attaching them to the various hooks. So let's go into how this is actually working. So the first thing I want to talk about, another, another acronym for us to, to learn about is BTF. So BPF sta BTF stands for BPF Type Format. Uh, it's a, special, a simple, space-efficient uh, debugging symbol format. So if you've ever worked with Dwarf, it's basically a, just a compressed, pared-down version uh, of that. So if you think about it, um, the Linux kernel is a compiled program just like any other. Uh, and it has all of the symbol information, or you can have all the symbol information for it. But since you know, the binary itself is, is massive, all the debug information is even bigger, uh, or makes it even bigger. So uh, BTF, because it's compressed and because you know, engineers have found a way to get all of that same information in much less space, enables us to efficiently um, uh, do all these relocations. And by relocations, I mean, you know, if we were to, uh, let's say, read a specific field in a test struct on a particular version, and that changes in another version, BTF enables us, or enables really libbpf, to read that debug information, see where that field has changed, like the actual memory offset, uh, find it for us, and, and read from there instead of where we initially uh, specified it to be. Uh, so he, here's a, a diagram that will uh, hopefully help explain that. So here you see we have on this, this right box, uh, or this box on the right, uh, is Tracy itself. So we have the user space side. We have libbpf that it's using to interact with the BPF programs and the BPF system. Uh, we have the Tracy BPF object itself. And then we have the kernel BTF, the BTF for the kernel it, it's running on. That BTF can be found either in slash sys kernel BTF VM Linux. So VM Linux is a, a special file. It's the uh, compiled kernel stuffed inside of an ELF binary. Uh, that will have a .BTF section if the kernel was compiled with a specific configuration option, config debug info BTF. Otherwise, libbpf also has an option for us to specify an external BTF file. Uh, and that brings us to another cool project that my team has worked on called BTF Hub. So if you are trying to support in your BPF project, if you're trying to support a uh, particular distribution or a particular kernel where this, con this kernel compile config option hasn't been specified, um, you normally wouldn't be able to run uh, a program that has CORE uh, enabled. So you would have to go back to that 
uh, previous solution that I, that I outlined that we were previously working with. Uh, but instead, you can pre-compile on your own the, um, the actual kernel for that version, include that debug information, extract that BTF information, and supply it as an external file, which is what we've done in this uh, GitHub repository, where you could just, instead of doing that compilation yourself, uh, download this, uh, these BTF files and load it with uh, your BPF program. So now we want to talk about uh, code changes that we had to make to Tracy. Uh, and really, this is more like code simplifications. It, it really uh, honestly cleaned up our code base. Uh, the first thing is vmlinux.h. So in the same way that we have that vmlinux file, which is the compiled kernel, uh, vmlinux.h is another generated file from that. So it goes into that debug information with all the different types and it produces a header file that has all of their type definitions. So if you take a, a quick look at this, you could see uh, the definition for underscore underscore U32. So if um, your BPF program is relying on that data type, you can import it and use it accordingly using vmlinux.h. Uh, I wrote a blog post about this file. There's, there's more to it. that is very cool. Um, you could check it out, the, the URL there on my personal blog. So you could see here the changes that we made in, uh, in our imports. We actually are currently, uh, currently have both of these. We have a, a compile time um, variable that, that we define, uh, but we're moving towards being able to remove this, um, this, this left side here. But on the left, we have all these user APIs and internal headers that we're importing, getting those definitions of the data types that we're trying to read from uh, in kernel. On the right, you see that we have, we're just importing vmlinux.h, as well as this uh, additional file that I want to talk about. So that's a, a missing definitions file. So while we do have the convenience of being able to just import a single header file, the vmlinux.h, to get all of our type definitions, uh, that does lack all of the macros and all the functions that we otherwise would be using in uh, those kernel headers. So macros certainly aren't put in the type information or, or aren't put in the debug information uh, and functions aren't, aren't included either. So uh, I had a conversation on the mailing list about the best way of handling it. Uh, and right now the best solution that anyone was able to uh, give me advice for uh, is to just redefine it. So theoretically, if there was a macro that um, changes from version to version, we would have to be manually updating that. Um, so we still have we still have work to do there. Uh, and uh, essentially, the last change is just using the correct header file. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, using the correct helper functions. So. Uh, you could see here we have this internal macro uh, in Tracy called read kern, where we zero out memory before doing a, a, a kernel read. Uh, and the only difference here is that instead of using BPF probe read, we're using BPF core read. Uh, the arguments are exactly the same. It works in the same way. It's just under the hood using BTF. Uh, and here's exactly that in action, reading a, a mount namespace ID. So the most exciting way that we're, we've been able to change Tracy and the real purpose of this talk has been distribution. So uh, previously, if we wanted to publish binaries of Tracy, where we want to support all those distributions that I had on that slide earlier, we would have to say, you know, here is Tracy for Ubuntu 2004, or here is Tracy for 2004, or, uh, or 2104. Um, or for specific kernel versions. Uh, now what we can do is we compile a single BPF object that has BTF enabled, and we embed it in our user space Go program. So at runtime, when we start up Tracy, it unloads that from memory and loads it uh, and 
you know, we can compile that Go program statically, so it's just a single artifact that, we're, that we can ship and run on any system. So this is, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, this, this same slide, but all these simple changes enable, enable us to not get bug reports about Tracy having uh, garbled info on a particular distribution uh, or someone's custom Gentoo-based kernel, uh, and certainly not on production CentOS servers. Uh, we now have the confidence to distribute Tracy to a wide array of environments and can focus on developing the great new features uh, that we want to add and less on the changes in different kernel versions. Uh, and more broadly, I would say that this is the future of VPF development, that this isn't going to be something that people are going to ask, like, is, is this BPF project CRE enabled? You know, as new kernels are, um, or major distribution kernels are shipping with BTF enabled by default, uh, you won't really have to worry about, about that at all. So you can have your BPF program written in confidence to not have to worry about if CRE is enabled or not. Uh, and for those custom kernels and those older kernels, uh, that's why we have BTF Hub. Uh, so I actually want to show a uh, demo of exactly this. Um, I'm going to quickly mirror displays. I'll make it easier. Uh, so here on this Linux VM, I have a, uh, oh, I'm sorry, is that, is that big enough? Okay. Uh, so here on this um, uh, Linux VM, I'm running Fedora. Uh, 34. This has a 5.12 kernel, uh, and I'm just going to run a version of Tracy so you can actually um, see what it does. Just uh, look at the first 20 lines. So here with this uh, debug flag turned on, we could see that I unpacked the CRE BPF object into memory, uh, and I'm loading that and, and running with that. And this is actually a, a static binary. Uh, and you could see that it's running properly. We have <clears throat> Uh, all these different commands that are being run. Uh, we have the events that are actually triggering um, uh, these to be printed. So this is uh, an LSM hook uh, of a file being opened. Um, this is a proc mem info. We have all of the arguments that are being uh, passed back into user space and being interpreted correctly, meaning that it's the, uh, we're relying on the proper definitions uh, and if we're not relying on the proper definitions, CRE is handling it for us to, to find the, uh, uh, where they've been relocated to. So here, I also have another VM. And this is running Ubuntu, I believe it's 2104. This is running a 5.11 kernel. I'll run the same command. Uh, and yeah, look at that. I have a security file open for starting it as well. Uh, and it, it, it did the same exact thing where it unpacked the embedded BPF object from memory um, uh, and loaded that into the kernel and ran it. Uh, so again, all the arguments are uh, properly, uh, properly displayed. Uh, and the kicker to all of this is that If we look at the SHA, uh, it's exactly the same file. That's where you're supposed to all clap and go, woo! <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, right, so that's what CR CRE gives us. Uh, next steps, things that we want to work on. Uh, working upstream to find a better solution that, than that missing definitions header. Uh, so, you know, one of the suggestions was having a, um, like, a, in Clang, have a, uh, like, built-in attribute for checking if a type is already defined so that we can still import the headers that we want but um, not worry about them having a, a collision with the names in vmlinux.h. Uh, better verifier output, so that's certainly not something that's related to CRE or even libbpf that's across the board, but 
we certainly ran into issues where uh, we had verifier output that we just could not make sense of uh, during this switch. Uh, documentation, so a recent effort that I've been working on is launching the libbpf read the doc site. So if you haven't seen that, um, it is a full API documentation for libbpf. You can go check it out uh, and contribute. It's sort of, um, if you're familiar with Go and GoDoc, it's exactly that. So uh, as we document more of the API, that documentation will get better. Uh, and certainly, we're going to keep working on, on BTF Hub. So go check out that repo as well. Uh, and, and that's my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>